Good morning, everyone. And, and welcome to the 47th Herbert H. Lehman Memorial Lecture. I'm Ricardo Fernandez, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event on behalf of the students, the faculty, and the administration of Lehman College. I want to begin by acknowledging our esteemed guests, including today's speaker, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations. I would also like to thank his wife, Ban Sun Tech, for being with us here uh, today. <laughs> and I would also want to uh, acknowledge the presence of the following special guests. Trustee Rita Di Martino of the City University of New York Board of Trustees. <laughs> My colleague, Dr. Thomas Isakenegbi, President of Bronx Community College. <laughs> Dr. Mary Pearl, the Interim Dean of the Macaulay Honors College of the City University of New York. <laughs> and Professor Victoria Sanford, the Chair of the Lehman Anthropology Department and the director of the Center for Human Rights and Peace Studies. <laughs> Dr. Sanford will moderate the Q&A portion of today's program. I want to add a special word of appreciation for Professor Yongkung Kim, who is here with us of the Department of Political Science of Lehman College for making this event possible. He was <laughs> And last, but certainly in my life, not least, is my wife, Patricia, who joins us in this special occasion. <laughs> Thank you. Now, in its fifth decade, this lecture is an annual event that recognizes the birthday of our namesake, the former New York governor, United States senator, and statesman, Herbert Henry Lehman. Born in, 19, in 1878, Herbert Lehman was, like many of our students, a child of immigrants, a fact that he never forgot. He understood that it was the wealth, it was the contributions, the sweat and toil and devotion to this country from millions of immigrants from every corner of the globe that made America what it is. Governor Lehman, as he was often referred to, was the chief executive of New York State, the Empire State, for 10 years before resigning his office to work as the first director of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. And he did this at the request of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his longtime friend. In that capacity, he oversaw the delivery of 24 million tons of food, clothing, and medical supplies to the victims of a war-torn Middle East and Europe, the largest international refugee relief effort in history. Upon completing that achievement, he was called to serve the people of New York again as their representative in the United States Senate. There, he became known as the conscience of the Senate. Herbert Lehman would certainly have been proud of the long list of distinguished guests, writers, scholars, educators, jurists, and public officials who have delivered the annual lecture that honors his legacy each year. Today, we add yet another name to that impressive list, the Honorable Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations, who will deliver a talk titled, From Turmoil to Opportunity, 
the United Nations in a changing global landscape. Secretary Ban was born in the Republic of Korea and later went to Seoul National University before attending the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade for Korea with posts in New Delhi, Washington DC, and Vienna. His tenure as Secretary General began on January 1st, 2007, and he was unanimously reelected in 2011. He will complete his service on December 31st, 2016. As the leader of the United Nations, Secretary General Ban has made climate change, human rights, and women's rights a priority for world leaders. To have the Secretary General of the United Nations at Lehman College is both an honor and also a sort of homecoming because 70 years ago, this month, from March to August 1946, the United Nations Security Council met on our historic campus. It was here when the campus was known as Hunter in the Bronx that Eleanor Roosevelt and her diplomatic colleagues finalized the draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a landmark document that is still guiding us in these troubled times. Last year, in an acknowledgement of this history, Lehman College received a remarkable gift that now graces our campus, a peace bell. The Lehman College peace bell is the direct result of a journey I took to Korea the Secretary General's native country in 2009. I learned about the World Peace Bell Park in Gangwon province in South Korea in the northern corner of the country, northeastern part of the country. The original peace bell was cast from empty cartridges from conflicts from all over the world. And this is an enormous, huge, Bell, I think he weighs about 20,000 tons. Literally, this bell turned weapons of destruction into a work of beauty. Working for peaceful resolutions in a troubled world has been the historic mission of the United Nations, and it has been a hallmark of the Secretary General's work throughout his life. So. Won't you please give a warm welcome to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. Thank you for your very kind introduction. Dr. Ricardo Al Fernandez, a president of Herbert H. Lehman College. Dr. Annie Morobel Sosa, provost of Lehman College. Dr. Mary Pearl, interim dean for the Macaulay Honors College of the City University of New York. And Dr. Una Clark, trustee of the City University of New York. Distinguished faculty members, distinguished guests, Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to deliver the 47th annual Herbert H. Lehman Memorial Lecture. It's a great to be in the Bronx. I have only one regret. The Yankees are still in Florida uh, for <laughs> spring training. With, with or without baseball, the Bronx is an amazing destination, once a symbol of urban uh, neglect. The borough today is in the midst of resurgence, uh, from new restaurants on Arthur Avenue to tech startups and green businesses. The Bronx is on the move. 
I'm energized by that strong community spirit. I admire the tolerance that has seen so many waves of immigrants find here in the Bronx, a haven and a home. One person who found a home in the Bronx was my predecessor, Utant, former Secretary General, who lived in Riverdale during his years as Secretary General. At that time, there was no official residence as I am now having. Wave Hill House was the residence of Gladin Jepp, uh, who served as acting Secretary General in the organization's earliest days. Here at Lehman College, I had the privilege of ringing the peace bell a short while ago, which was introduced by the president. I thank Mr. Yong Lee for his generosity in making this addition to your campus possible. Your bell was inspired by World Peace Bell Park in Korea. It is also very similar to the Japanese Peace Bell at UN headquarters in Manhattan. We ring that bell every year on September 21st, the International Day of Peace, to sound the call for global harmony and nonviolence. This is yet another symbol of the historic bonds between Lehman College and the United Nations. For five months in 1946, years before the United Nations moved into its own headquarters, this campus was our home. Again, as was... <clears throat> Yesterday, I received a brochure from this college showing all historical pictures, photographs. That was inspiring for me. It was here that diplomats and staff came together to help the world recover in the immediate aftermath of Second World War and move toward a future of progress and peace. But our ties with the Lehman College go beyond buildings and conference rooms. Robert Lehman himself helped to set the tone of the new organization. As head of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRRA, in the 1940s, even before the United Nations was born, he oversaw efforts to provide life-saving assistance uh, to millions of people. I think the UN High Commissioner for Refugees should be this uh, successor organization. Uh, today at UN headquarters, there is a great deal of art on display, but very few, very few people's portraits are uh, on this display in the United Nations, because once we have individuals' portraits displayed in the United Nations headquarters. There will be thousands of people who want their portrait to be displayed. <laughs> there are eight secretaries generals, including myself, and their portraits. And Nelson Mandela, or Gandhi, you, you name very few, very few. But among them is a painting, portrait of Herbert Lehman. You may come, I'll invite you to see it. This portrait is viewed and visited by thousands, many thousand people every day, every day. I saw it yesterday again. Much has changed since Lehman made his mark on the world, but he would recognize some features of our global landscape. Uh, today's conflicts and persecution have forced 60 million people, 60 million people, half of them children and women, to flee their homes. This is more than at any time 
the largest number of people displaced and refugees since the end of Second World War. Lehman would understand also the urgency of the organization's mission of peace, development, and human rights. As a senator and governor, he campaigned against injustice and defended the rights of immigrants. Today, refugees, migrants, and minorities across the world face a ra rising hatred. Inequality is driving people farther apart. Women and girls face appalling violence and discrimination. I want to talk to you today about what the United Nations is doing to address these challenges and about the role you can and must play in carrying forward Lehman's spirit and in helping to build lives of dignity for all the people around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with the Lehman College itself. Yours is a wonderfully diverse community. You have students from all around the world. I heard that more than 80 some countries, you find people and students here. Contributing experiences and ideas from different perspectives and different cultures and traditions. Education at Lehman College has been a gateway to a better life for many thousands of people. Many immigrant families know the sacrifices your loved ones have made, including for those of you who are the first in your family to go to college. Many of you may have a special window of understanding on the plights of those escaping from insecurity, inequality, and injustice, and bigotry that they often face. You have all seen the heartbreaking images of people perishing at sea uh, during perilous escapes from conflict. You have heard the stories of those left stranded in the desert by ruthless human traffickers. These are people no different than you and me. Many have lost everything they have, homes, jobs, loved ones, and they have no choice but to flee to an uncertain future. Many others are seeking better lives because of discrimination, grinding poverty, or the brutality of drug cartels and criminal gangs. My own family was forced to flee our village, like Professor Kim. He is much, much senior to me. But I was six years old when Korean War broke out in 1950. I didn't know much about, but it was very difficult. What I felt, what I saw was a difficulty. It was my grandparents, my parents, who had to run here and there to bring something to feed their children. The United Nations brought us food, medi medicine, and textbooks. UNICEF, UNESCO, and, all, and also 21 countries have sent their troops. Those include five countries who have sent some medical uh, hospitals and all humanitarian assistance. They saved Korean people and the country from the brinks of collapse. The United Nations was our lifeline. It's a blue flag, United Nations flag, was a beacon of hope for all the Korean people. That flag, which you see here, is still the beacon of hope to millions of millions of people around the world. Whenever I travel, whenever I saw those young people or women, a vulnerable group of people who, without United Nations assistance, would 
be living in a very terribly difficult situations, then I am very much humbled when they still believe that United Nations flag is their hope, their beacon of hope. That really makes me humble and motivates me. Always, every morning, when I get up, I think, what should I do? What can I do better or differently for those people? Thinking about my days in 1950s. Today, the refugee crisis is showing no signs of lessening. The United Nations is, is calling for greater solidarity and compassion. We are emphasizing the need for all countries to help, including by granting asylum. And we are speaking out against the hate-filled rhetoric and discrimination against refugees and migrants. Whether it comes from leaders, office seekers, ordinary citizens, or the media. In an interconnected world like this, we need to build bridges, not walls, or barriers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these large-scale movements is unprecedented in the history. And these movements are signs of deeper, deeper problems, from conflict to a lack of jobs, and disillusionment and frustration of people. The United Nations is working hard to address the root causes of these conflicts and the underlying drivers of extremism and terrorism. Today in Geneva, the United Nations Special Envoy and the mediators are pressing the parties to the Syrian conflict to engage in dialogue. Just the two days ago, March 15th, we marked the sixth year of Syrian conflict. During the last five, full five years, almost 300,000 people were killed, and millions of people left their countries, forced to flee. We have at least 4.5 million refugees now being hosted by the United Nations in different countries, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and North Iraq, and some Northern Africa. At least 13 million people most of the older people in Syria, they are affected. They need the daily assistance from the United Nations. That's why in May, I'm going to convene the first ever in the history of the United Nations World Humanitarian Summit meeting in Istanbul, Turkey. And I'm asking world leaders to come and show their political commitment and leadership. There are so many crises happening all around the, at this time, all at the same time. It's just untenable, uncontrollable. So we have to see how we can have a better, sustainable, predictable way of assisting and helping these uh, people with life-saving assistance. We continue our efforts to resolve conflicts from Yemen to South Sudan, where civilians remain the primary targets and victims of atrocities and utter disregard for human rights. Other threats loom on the global landscape. For example, provocative acts and rhetorics by the Deep Democratic People's Republic of Korea, including its recent nuclear test and ballist technology used missiles are deeply troubling challenges to international peace and security. The Security Council has acted swiftly and decisively and firmly by imposing another sanctions. But sanction itself is not the end of, of resolving this issue. By imposing sanction, we are giving strong message to DPRK to abide by 
the norms of international community and become a normal citizen of this uh, community. We are working to put in place the deeper foundation of peace and try to reduce the tension in the Korean Peninsula. Last year, despite global divisions over conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Ukraine, and elsewhere, world leaders came together to adopt an inspiring new development agenda, a 15-year blueprint for a better world. It's true that we are living in an era of peril and challenges and conflicts, but at the same time, world leaders, United Nations, are showing promises and hope to the people of the world. At the heart of this plan, there are 17 sustainable development goals, which covers all spectrums of our life and of our planet, planet Earth. This means we are first trying to end poverty by 2030 and building inclusive societies on a healthy planet. We are trying to put our people, 7 billion, and our planet Earth onto a sustainable path. Women's empowerment is a threat running through all these 17 goals and has been a priority across my decade as a Secretary General of the United Nations. We cannot make the world better for all if we exclude half the population of this world. We must empower women. <laughs> we often say half the sky. Half the sky, they're women. If we don't give more to women, at least we should give equal rights in political, social, economic field. <laughs> Thank you for your strong support and engagement. <laughs> I will take it. I will take it. I hope you will also support me in ending violence against women and girls. They must be able to enjoy full their rights and realize their potential without any fear. That is our priority as a Secretary General of the United Nations. This week, now, currently, very important meeting is now taking place. Commission on the Status of Women. You see, we have more than 100 women ministers and at least 40, 50 vice ministers. I think this United Nations is a full of world's distinguished world women leaders. I am very much energized and very much in encouraged by their strong engagement and <clears throat> power and energy. This, I'm working for this. I'm also passionate about empowering world youth. Again, half the global population, at least 3.5 billion people, young people, they are under 25 years of age. That means our world is still very young. Our future stability and well-being depends on investing in and working with and working for these young people. That is why I appointed the United Nations Envoy on Youth. First ever, this is again first ever, to help connect the United Nations to young people. He is now trying to connect with the youth organizations with the United Nations. That is also why last month, the United Nations launched global initiative on decent jobs. And if we do not provide decent jobs to young people and women, then this becomes a source of political instability. When the community is not happy with the leaders, because of their lack of opportunities, jobs, or whatever, participations, then this clearly leads to political instability, 
then political instability becomes very much difficult element for economic development. When there is no job, then people will be driven to the corner where they will find no other place to go. Then they become easily the prey of extremists and terrorists and drug or criminal, criminal organizations. That is why I'm urging world leaders to address all these root causes and provide enough and decent opportunities to young, young men. Young people can be at the center of also climate change. You are consumers who can demand sustainable products. You are innovators, particularly young students here, who can create energy, energy breakthroughs. You are voters who can elect leaders who do not deny the problems which we are having. You have a legitimate right to challenge your leaders of this community. You can challenge your president, senators, congresspersons, business CEOs, and community leaders. Just tell them that this is my world where I will have to live with my children. Just make sure that this society becomes equal, just justice, that's your legitimate right for young people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are many ways, many areas where academics, academic communities can also contribute. Climate change is also one of the area. It's not because you have many professors dealing with the science, but even just normal people, normal students, but you can teach and educate the students and the future leaders how they can contribute themselves to the development and better and prosperous future of this world. When it comes to climate change, it's a real. There were some skeptics, but their voices have been completely silenced with the adoption of Paris Agreement December last year. Sea levels are still rising. Unless we contain this global temperature rise below two degrees, and if possible, 1.5 degrees centigrade, by the end of this century, this world and these human, human beings will face a serious problem because of the sea level rising and temperature rising. We are seeing more floods, wild, wildfires, and droughts. That means hunger will rise and economies will fail. Last December, in another sign of giving promise and vision, the world leaders adopt, adopted this Paris Agreement. Next month, on 22nd of April, I have invited world leaders again to the United Nations to sign this Paris Agreement so that it can become effective as soon as possible. President Fernandez, distinguished faculty members, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I have been Secretary General of this great organization for almost 10 years. There is the one inescapable truth about all of the challenges we face. No single country however powerful, however resourceful one may be, like the United States, or no single organization like the United Nations cannot do it alone. We have to work together. We have to build a strong uh, partnership. Over the years, United States has been a very generous contributor of humanitarian aid, development aid, and the leader in the fight against the hunger and terrorism and international peace and security. The country's economy and innovations have been engines of progress. Its embrace of diversity has inspired the world. I hope that the students 
as emerging global citizens, will make the case for even stronger uh, global engagement. In today's world, this globalized and transformed. The walls between the nations and international continue to fall away. The international interest and the national interest are increasingly one and the same. We need to work together uh, towards new heights of international cooperation. I know it is easier, it's easier to exploit fears or to think that one can impose solutions on others, but these are not the solutions for 21st century. They are recipes for disaster. During my time as a Secretary General, I have seen many inspiring examples of collective action that are taking the world in promising uh, new directions. Not so long ago, <clears throat> there was a widespread fear that Ebola virus would spread globally. But the United Nations and our non-governmental organizations pulled together and acted very quickly. Uh, today, the disease is under control, and the th three most affected West African countries have been declared Ebola-free. But we still have some Zika virus. There are many other diseases, tropical diseases, which we have to address. In Colombia, the longest conflict in the Americas is nearing its end as the government and opposition took the enlightened decision uh, to settle their differences through dialogue. And in clinics, labs, and classrooms across the world, dedicated individuals are nurturing young lives and new ideas uh, that will advance human well-being and enhance our shared future. Those who seek to divide often speak about, speak the loudest, that is one lesson I tell young global citizens who are here, all around the world. Again, please raise your voice. I, as a Secretary General, <clears throat> have some constraints sometimes, political constraints, to raise as high as I want to do. Even though I have a mandate, I have a moral authority, but still, sometimes I need to be uh, sensitive. But Young people, you don't have a limit. <laughs> you just raise your voice. <clears throat> Please make good use of that freedom. We need you to rise up for civil rights, for social justice, for equal opportunity, and fair play here in the United States and beyond, all around the world. As governor of New York, Herbert Lehman had the honor of opening the 1939 World's Fair. His words on that occasion still ring true today. I quote, the hopes and aspirations of America are in no way different from those of the rest of the world, unquote. All members of our human family want basic services, decent jobs, democrat democratic systems, human rights, and peace. When we unite to realize human progress for everyone, we can succeed, we can thrive. You are not here at Lehman College just for yourselves, but for our common uh, future. I call all of you, I call on all of you to give back what you have now as a global citizen. Rise to the challenges of your generation and join forces with the United Nations to make this world better for all. And I thank you for your attention and I count on your continuing engagement and strong commitment as a global citizen. I thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>
especially like your youth. <laughs> yes, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Victoria Sanford, who will uh, pose some of the questions that uh, have been prepared by some of our students. Jenny? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I don't, is it on? Yes. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, it's my honor to share these questions with you that we've collected from our students. The first comes from Jenny Guerrero, who is a student in anthropology and human rights, and she asks, um, she says, it has been said that once your term is up this year, it would be a great idea to have a woman be the next <coughs> UN Secretary General so women around the world can have a voice. What are your thoughts on how we can give women a voice around the world, and how can we ensure that women's rights can be exercised without <coughs> fear of repercussions? That question is exactly in line with the, what I have said, and I have been preaching. I've been saying that uh, whenever your organization, or whatever it may be, government or uh, companies, when you have uh, more women, then you'll, your organization and your society will be much better. The Fortune the magazine, the one a few years ago, had research of 500 uh, companies, big companies around the world. Then the more women are sitting in the board, then the more profit these companies were making. Mm -hmm. Normally, we think that the women make a smarter decision. <laughs> That's why... <clears throat> <laughs> That's why I have been really trying to lead by example. I really wanted to lead by example as I preach. When you just preach, you don't do it, then nobody will follow you. I have changed the whole this uh, landscape of the United Nations. When I first came, that was uh, 62 years after this organization was born. There were very few women in the UN system. Uh, when I say women, senior decision-making uh, position ho holders. I have brought this up to almost 45 to 55% now. I have appointed... <laughs> almost 150 very distinguished women staff from coming from all around the world uh, to uh, very senior, senior most uh, positions in the United Nations. Among them, there are some people who have really shattered this glass ceiling, perception of a glass ceiling. What is that? Oh, women, they cannot control these uh, soldiers or military or security uh, matters. I have appointed five women who are the heads of United Nations mission, where under, under whom from 20,000 or 12,000 or 1,000 least, Soldiers are under their control. Even they are higher than force commander, military commanders are there under their uh, control. For that, uh, you must have read in the newspapers and media, and I also have been following, Then there has been increasing, increasing voices that after 70 years, there is high time for any woman, distinguished woman, to lead this organization. I've, I've found, I have taken note that there is a very strong uh, support for that. But to be frank with you, uh, it's not in my hands, it's in the hands of uh, member states uh, to decide who should be my uh, next successor. President Obama will have no, no voice in who should be next to President of the United States. It's a U.S. <laughs> citizens, likewise, but Personally, I believe it's a good idea, but I sincerely hope that the next Secretary General of the United Nations 
will be the most qualified, most distinguished and capable person, but hopefully, let's hope that that most capable, distinguished person will be a woman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Emma Pizzardo, who is in Professor Galvez's Ethnography of Latin America class. And she says, migration and human mobility are a growing phenomenon that the world leaders are struggling to deal with. What is the best possible way for the United Nations and government leaders to effectively manage this ongoing situation that seems to have no end in sight? Again, I think this has become, this has been emerged as one of the most serious global, global problems now. I explained at length about what United Nations is doing. It's very sad, heartbreaking. If you visit any one of the refugee camps, the conditions are there. However, we've been really trying to provide the Good assistance is uh, miserable, really heartbreaking. It affects me as a person even many, many days uh, just because of uh, images, lingering images. And then in European countries, they are now still have a lot of uh, political uh, debate and even today uh, there is uh, going to be uh, European Union summit meeting to deal with this matter, and I have been meeting all the times with speaking and meeting with the European leaders. Last week, I had a uh, meeting in Berlin with uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, just to focus on this issue. I highly commended her compassionate uh, leadership and compassionate leadership. But when it comes to uh, each and every country's Nobody wants to have all these foreign guests, unknown foreign guests in, in their soil. I've been urging world leaders, this is a human rights issues, this is a human dignity issues. Based on U U United Nations Charter, you must show compassionate leadership based on international humanitarian and human rights and based on shared responsibilities. Try to provide some official channel of receiving migrants and refugees. There are many ways. For example, academic communities, they can expand the scholarships for those people. Then they don't need to risk their lives to come to European countries. If there, they know that there are some open uh, channels, if they provide the job opportunities and try to integrate them, integrate them into their societies. But it may be easier to say than doing when it comes to the countries. And that's why end of uh, this month, uh, I'll be going to Geneva to convene the resettlement conference in Geneva. And in September, I'm going to convene the summit meeting on September 19th at the United Nations, a summit meeting on large movement of global, large global movement of refugees and migrants in, at the United Nations. President Obama also is uh, showing a strong, a strong support and he's also going to uh, convene uh, one of his uh, uh, conference under his uh, chairmanship, and I am going to have uh, the world leaders uh, meeting on this matter. So we are working very hard. We are working very hard. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. We have um, here today, up toward the top, a lot of students from the high school across the st street that are going to have to leave shortly. But before they do, I just want to read a question from one of them um, who says, I am a high school senior who is interested in a career in international relations. What kind of education and other experiences are necessary to be considered for a UN position? Oh, welcome. Welcome to the United Nations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we welcome uh, young, talented 
uh, uh, people uh, who really want to uh, work in the United Nations, with the United Nations, uh, that's, we always want to have a new blood, uh, with a new vision, and new commitment, and new energy. Uh, that's why we start from internship and all uh, regular uh, recruitment uh, processes. Those who really want to join the United Nations uh, should cultivate some global citizenship. There should be, one should have a strong commitment based on human rights and compassion. What I'd like to tell young people, young people are always dynamic and full of energy and full of passion. But what most of the people lack is compassion, compassion for others. They, people just tend to think about only themselves and their own family members, not neighbors, or if they live in other countries, they are easily forgotten. Therefore, one should have both passion and compassion, then global citizenship, and try to cultivate your language proficiency, because most of you speak fluent English, so, but in, if you can speak some other, uh, one of these uh, official languages, uh, that will really help your chance uh, being admitted to the United Nations. Great, thank you. We have just one more question. Thank you. And this question comes from Raven Azuna, who's in anthropology and human rights, and she would like to know what the United Nations and the World Health Organization are doing and are planning to do to suppress the Zika virus this summer. Yes, that is another serious one. I just briefly mentioned about Zika uh, virus. Um, as I said, there are many unknown the viruses are here uh, in our world. We've been suffering during my time as a Secretary General, H1N1 really shocked the world. Uh, then Ebola terrified the whole world. Then now we are hearing about the Zika uh, virus. And there are many, at least 10 uh, neglected tropical diseases which, on which people do not invest much in terms of research and manufacturing the vaccines. Zika was there since 1940s, but has not been much given attention. But Zika in itself, I'm told by WHO and the expert, is, is rather mild one, except for pregnant women, except for pregnant women. This, um, <clears throat> the neurological complications that are suspected to be linked to Zika uh, has been declared a public health emergency of international concern by World Health Organization. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Margaret Chan uh, several times of the uh, World Health Organization. Uh, we, yesterday even uh, we had a telephone uh, video conferences. The World Health Organization and United Nations are in uh, contacting all the partners and we are also working with on all fronts, uh, countries to control Zika virus. Priorities are enhanced to enhance surveillance, and monitoring, and provide the training on this clinical management and diagnosis and mosquito control. All these are what we are doing. A lot of companies and research institutions are working on a number of products, vaccines and therapies, and this is what we are doing. So we are very much on alert to, to address and to eradicate this Zika virus. Fortunately, we learned very valuable lessons in our dealing with the Ebola. As I said, we have many peacekeepers and missions around the world, but we never established 
such mission related with the uh, disease. The, for the first time in UN history, uh, 2014, I established the health-related special mission and mobilized the whole resources and energy and power and political will. The uh, U.S. helped a lot. United Kingdom and France, they sent their troops to each one of the three Western African countries. We have learned very valuable uh, means and know-how and lessons, so we are going to do all what we uh, should do to eradicate this Zika virus. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, this, conclu this concludes our, our event. Let's give the Secretary General our... <laughs>